All right, guys, let's get started. I'm Audrey Meninga. I'm the Invasive Species Specialist for the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network. And this is our Autumn Olive Landowner Workshop. Uh, we are going to be recording this and putting it up on our YouTube channel. So you can watch it later if you're like me and you're like, I don't need to write that down. And then later you're like, I did need to write that down. You can look at it again. Um, if you guys would all like to in the chat box, say who you are, um, if you're with an organization or where you're from, that would be great. We'd love to hear that. And uh, we are going to be taking questions at the end. I have Fields Ratliff, our habitat manager, and also Emily, who does her, our Go Beyond Beauty. Um, they are going to be helping me manage the chat room. And then we also have Josh Shields, who will be talking a little bit later. So let's get started here. All right, so we are a partner-based organization. Um, we have a lot of partners. So we partner with all of the um, conservation districts in our counties, which includes Manistee, Leelanau, Benzie, and Grand Traverse. And then we also have other partners everywhere from the Forest Service and Sleeping Bear Dunes uh, down to garden clubs. Uh, you can see some of our major partners here. And so we are CISMA, and if you are not familiar with CISMAs, uh, we are a Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, which is why we are called a CISMA. It's much easier to say. Um, so every county in the state of Michigan is covered by a CISMA, and each one is unique. They're different sizes, um, they have different priority species, and they have different programs that they help run. You can see the little this little map here shows the breakup of the SISMAs. We are obviously up in this, these four counties right here. Um, partnership is the key to SISMA success. We partner with so many people. Um, if you're not from our county area, you can check out michiganinvasives.org to find your SISMA. And these are some of our programs that we're currently running. So Go Beyond Beauty is a voluntary program um, we work with landscapers and nurseries to not sell or plant high priority invasive species in our area. It's, like I said, completely voluntary. These people are going above and beyond to help out and stop the spread of some of these, war these really bad invasive species. Um, and then we also do some work bees. They're focused mostly on garlic mustard. They were a little thrown off this year, but hopefully we can get back on track next year. Um, and we help with control, doing, we have our own high priority species, so Japanese knotweed, invasive bittersweet, garlic mustard, and invasive phragmites are our major four that we are working with landowners mostly, but also with our partners to help control in our area, as well as early detection species. Uh, you know, we have three or four species that are only found in specific spots in our service area, and we're working to get those under control. Uh, we also do a lot of outreach, so we do a lot of presentations. Emily likes to say we'll talk to anybody who will sit still. Uh, and that has been a really good way to encourage those partnerships to grow as well as to get information out about invasive species. So habitat matters is kind of what we go with. Um, you know, for people, especially up here, it's recreation and enjoyment, getting out and seeing nature. Uh, tourism is a big industry in our area, and we are trying to help preserve that as well as wildlife, you know, habitat and um, having all of these native plants that you're used to seeing in the forest. Like monarchs, uh, native plants, you know, particularly milkweed are needed for monarchs. And when you have a bunch of invasive species, they can outcompete that milkweed and it's contributing to the loss of monarchs that we have, but also pollinators in general. So we have all of these species that are specific to our area that are native. They rely on native plants in order to, um, in order to grow and to stay stable. And you know, the whole food web going on, we need to have the native insects so that the birds can feed their babies. Um, and all of those are so important in this area. So you can see that this is literally just butterfly and moth species that are supported by natives, like the oak sports 534 different types of butterflies and moth. Um, even the chestnut doing 125. They need these plants in order to complete their own cycles and to help support the rest of the food web. 
And looking at invasives, you can see here, this is how many species are supported in their homeland. This is how many they are supported in North America. And this is how long they've been here. So invasive Phragmite is one of our priority species, only supports five species in North America, but it's been here for over 300 years. So it's definitely something that we're looking at stopping. And looking at what's invasive, the formal definition, a non-native species that harms people, the environment, or the economy. What we're looking at is trying to get to these invasive species when the population is still small. So we're looking at this introduction where there's just one plant, just this one garlic mustard plant, you walk by, you pull it, maybe you come back next year to check and make sure nothing's come up out of the seed bank, and then you've controlled that population. But when you don't get to it early enough, this is what it looks like instead. This takes much longer than walking by and pulling. You're definitely going to be monitoring the seed bank because that far, that far of a population has definitely put a lot of seeds into the seed bank. So we're trying to get it down here at the introduction. Doesn't always work that way, unfortunately, very rarely, but that's our goal, which leads us into autumn olive. Looking at the history of autumn olive, it was native to much of Asia. It was very important in barren soils. It helps um, with erosion control, which is how it was pitched to people to plant. When it was introduced to North America in 1830, um, you know, the conservation districts have a very checkered past with autumn olive. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with that. They advocated for planting it as erosion control. A lot of people advocated planting it as wildlife. The berries, they said, birds love the berries. Plant it to support the birds. Um, but we noticed eventually that, you know, it wasn't going so great. Uh, so starting in 1994, it was illegal to sell autumn olive in Michigan. Some of the other names for autumn olive are Japanese silverberry, spreading oleaster, and also Russian olive, which we'll touch on in a little bit. Going over ID for autumn olive, I'm sure all of you know what it looks like, but it's a medium to tall shrub. It looks very shrubby, often has multiple uh, stalks coming out of the ground, branching off each other, wild and crazy. Um, the plant is covered in silvery bronze scales, including the bark, the leaves, the flower, the fruit, all of it. Um, some of the stems might wear down into thorns. Um, they aren't a true thorn, but they do poke just like a true thorn. I can confirm this. Uh, and it grows new plants through seeds and root shoots. Um, it's very good at suckering, especially after it has been treated. Um, the roots also fix nitrogen, which is bad for the natives. The natives are used to working in these nitrogen poor soils. Um, and they can't compete with autumn olive for that. And when they can't compete with autumn olive, it just encourages other invasives to grow. So these are some IDs. You can see the silvery leaf right here, these very shiny berries. Um, the leaves are shiny on the front as well. And a field of autumn olive is very recognizable when you drive by it. You can see it's a little, a little white almost. Um, and you can also see in the background here, you can see a little yellow leaf here. That's also a very distinctive thing with autumn olive. So looking at Russian olive, Russian olive is a separate plant. Um, it is still invasive, but it's less common up here. It grows more like a tree. You can see in this photo down here, it's not shrubby. It has one stalk that it's growing off of. Um, these leaves are very silvery and they're a lot longer, a little thinner. Um, and the leaves or the flowers will be a little bit more yellow. You can kind of see that with this picture up here. Um, and the fruits just don't quite have that shiny sheen to them. Um, but like I said, it's still invasive. You can treat it the same way as you would autumn olive. We are looking at autumn olive lookalikes now. So buffalo berry is actually a native shrub. You can see in this top uh, picture here. It looks very similar from far away to an autumn olive, but, um, and it does still have these red berries, but you can also see that these leaves are thicker, a little bit more leathery. It's gonna be smaller in size, 
Um, and this also isn't going to grow in a disturbed place. You're not going to find it in a, a, a feral field uh, or on the like, very edges of somewhere that's getting cut um, like you would autumn olive. Invasive honeysuckles is another one. I'm sure you all are familiar with honeysuckle as well. Usually people that have autumn olive also have honeysuckle. It still has those same oval leaves. It's got the red fruits. It's going to grow in those disturbed areas. Um, but they don't have that silvery, the silvery leaves. The berries aren't quite the same color. They also tend to be bunched instead of just haphazard along the, the shrub. And you can see up here too, uh, it's got these hollow stems. So if you cut off a branch, you can look straight down in the middle of that stem, um, which is also a good way to tell uh, an invasive honeysuckle from a native honeysuckle. We do have a couple of native honeysuckle species. Chances are it's invasive. The natives don't grow quite as populous as the, the uh, natives, or the natives don't grow quite as populous as the invasives. So autumn olive problems. Again, I'm sure you're all familiar with this because you probably all have an autumn olive problem or you wouldn't be here. Uh, it grows very fast. It's very good at taking over open areas. It can black road signs um, and also road visibility. It's considered, it can be considered what's a food desert. When it gets into that open field, it's the only insect thing that insects can eat while it's flowering. And it's the only bird food when it's fruiting. Um, so that's the only option these animals and the species have. Um, again, soil impacts, it does that nitrogen fixation. It also does allelopathy. So that means that those roots are putting out chemicals into the soil that are then uh, inhibiting growth for other plants. And again, that promotes invasive growth because the other invasives are better at adapting to those kinds of things. And again, it does spread very easily. It's got all of the berries it puts out that are very good at growing from that. And also um, the roots, like I said, very good at suckering. So the autumn olive law, autumn olive is illegal to sell, move, trade, or share under Michigan law. You know, that means if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, can I dig up one of those shrubs and put it in my yard? You can't. It is actually illegal to do that. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. So autumn olive treatments. Um, there is a fine line between all of autumn olive management and aggravation. There are many successful ways to control autumn olive. We're gonna to touch over a lot of them tonight. Um, and keep in mind that, you know, there's possibly even more than what we touch on here. Um, any control of any invasive species, not just autumn olive, is never going to be a one and done, unfortunately. If that was how invasive species worked, that would be fantastic, but it's actually the opposite. So in year one, you're looking at doing treatment. Year two, you're gonna be doing a follow-up treatment. You're gonna to wanna to see how that first treatment went. Maybe it wasn't very successful and you need to do another round of treatments. Maybe it was very successful and now you need to change up the method that you're doing. And then in year three, you're gonna be doing some monitoring, seeing what's coming back up, how much is coming back up. Uh, autumn olive can grow more abundantly if it's treated one year and then left alone the next year. Um, this releases the seeds from the soil, again, with that allelopathy that's stopping other plants from growing instead. Um, using best management practices and sticking with it is crucial for success. So starting at the beginning, what do you have? Do you have autumn olive? Do you have honeysuckle? Do you have a different kind of invasive species? Um, what else do you have growing there? Are there some natives growing that maybe you want to save? Are there trees? Um, and how much is there? Do you have 10 acres of solid autumn olive? Do you have a couple plants growing here and there? Um, and where are they growing? Are they growing on a hillside, an open field? Can you get equipment back there easily? Or is it going to be very strenuous to be getting there to do the treatment? And your end goal, what do you want to do with this area next? Do you want to forest it? Do you want to plant in natives? Do you want it to be a prairie? Um, are you looking at turning it into cropland? It's very important to know what you want to do with the, with the area before you start treatment so that you can take steps while you're doing treatment to get there. And then the process preference. Do you want to do a physical treatment with no herbicides, a chemical treatment, or a cultural treatment? And a lot of times a combination of one or two or all three is the best way to go. And then we're looking at 
who's going to be doing the work? Is it going to be you or do you want a contractor? Um, ISN does have a list of contractors. I think most of you received that list in the email. Um, you can contact them. It includes herbicide safety or herbicide certified contractors, or you can be doing it yourself. Keep in mind, if you do it yourself, that's a lot of time commitment. If you contract somebody, that's a money commitment. So, you know, you just got to take the pros and cons there. And then when are you going to be doing it? If you're doing it in the spring, there are certain types of chemical treatments you can't do in the spring. If you're doing it in the winter, you need to use different chemical formulations. Looking at the weather, maybe you don't want to do it in peak July when it's 100 degrees. Maybe you don't want to go out in December when it's negative five. Um, and that ties into the time of year as well. And then after you do that first year of treatment, how are you going to continue to control the autumn olive? Are you going to be putting in plantings to help shade out the autumn olive? Are you going to be mowing it a lot? Or is there another method that you're looking at treating? How will you know if you succeeded? You'll know because no autumn olive came up. You have to go back and check constantly. All right, and getting into actual treatment. The physical methods, this is without any herbicides. It's good for small populations and young plants. Obviously, if you have 10 acres that's just straight autumn olive, you're not going to want to go around and dig up each autumn olive plant. Um, so doing a polar dig method, um, we have, this is called a polar bear here. Um, you can kind of see Emily is demonstrating it in this photo. Uh, it's latching on to the base of a sh the shrub, and then you're, it's using leverage to pull it out of the ground, giving you that strength to rip the roots out. Um, we also say that you can cut it low to the ground. Um, the stump can re-sprout, so keep that in mind, but if you're going to be constantly cutting, like if you're mowing it, um, that's another method that you can use. We also have these buckthorn baggies um, that have had mixed results. The idea is that you're putting this baggie over the stump and you're tying it very tightly at the base of the stump. You need it to touch the ground. No sunlight can get to that stump, um, which is how it becomes effective, it basically just shades out the, the autumn olive so it can't resucker. Um, you can do these treatments any time of the year. Keep in mind that if you're doing them in the fall, that is a bunch of debris you have that might have berries on it. Um, and what are you gonna do to contain those berries? Uh, you can pile it into one pile, and then at least if you have all the berries together, you know exactly where it will probably be coming up again. Um, and then keep in mind, you know, safety equipment for doing this. We have a little gloves icon down here. You probably are going to want to use gloves. Again, they aren't true thorns, but they feel like true thorns when they're in your skin. And this is a physical removal demonstration that Fields did for us. So you can see this wood block helps give that little bit of leverage so that your thing doesn't sink into the ground clamps on right at the base and pulls it just right out. And it's kind of a little bit blurry, but this is what that root system looks like. Excuse me. It's sending off shoots everywhere. So that's what you're dealing with when you're pulling these out of the ground. Going on to chemical treatments, uh, cut stump is what we recommend um, for any large areas or large trees. You're gonna have low risk for drift um, of herbicides. Like if you were foliar spraying, you know, there's a chance that that spray gets somewhere else. If you're cut stumping, the only thing you're treating is this thing right here. And it's very, very precise where you're putting it. Um, some of the herbicides that you can look at using, these are the active ingredients in them, is a triclopyr. This is a selective uh, herbicide. So it's targeting something specific and it won't be targeting things like grasses. So if you're working in a field, it might be a better thing to use that. Um, glyphosates will also work, but they will kill grasses if there is any off-target uh, off spray. Um, you're looking at doing a little bit of a higher concentration than you would be with a foliar spray. And actually, Josh will be covering this a little bit more later on about finding doing an easy uh, chemical mixture that you know, you aren't buying a whole jug of a glyphosate that you have to mix to spray onto there. Um, you can do these treatments any time of year, except spring. During the springtime, 
everything's getting flushed out of the shrub as it starts putting out its leaves um, and it's not taking things down into the roots, which is what you're aiming for. You're trying to get that herbicide into the roots to kill it off. Um, and again, if you're doing it in the fall, you're going to have those berries on it. Um, in the winter, you're going to want to use an oil-based uh, mixture. The oil really helps the herbicide stick onto that stump. Um, and I believe Josh is going to be talking a little bit more about that later as well. And here are some cut stump supplies. So you can see over here we have our loppers, which get a lot bigger plants than you would expect. A handsaw and then clippers, anything basically that can give you a clean cut, is, which is what you're looking for, that works. Anything that can cut through it. Um, you can see for bigger stuff, we've got our chainsaw and our brush saw. Obviously, please be safely trained in how to use those, um, as well as making sure you wear your protective equipment, the gloves, the hard hat, chaps, ear protection, eye protection, closed toed shoes. Um, and you can see over here, this is our herbicide picture here. Um, so we have a foamer, which we'll be demonstrating as well in a little bit, and then a hand sprayer. This is called a magic wand. It just has a sponge at the end. It's a plastic tube that you can pour your herbicide mixture into. It has a sponge at the end and you just lightly tap it. We'll also be demonstrating that a little bit later. And a backpack sprayer, that's not normal. You wouldn't traditionally use that for a cut stump treatment, but you can. It is another piece of equipment that you can. Um, and then in the background, we have some of our safety materials. So this yellow thing here is a, um, we call it, it's called a pig mat but it's what we do all of our chemical mixing on. It gives us just another layer between our chemicals and the ground. If we happen to spill some, it's on that mat and we can clean that up. Underneath that, we have our spill kit in case the mat doesn't work or we spill too much. Um, you always wanna make sure you have a way to safely clean up anything that could possibly spill. And then just shop towels. Um, and when you're spraying and you know, looking again, you're gonna want some kind of head protection. Um, Herbicide can get in, can be absorbed through the skin very easily through the top of your head. Looking at having gloves, you don't want to be touching these chemicals with your bare hands. Another easy way to get your skin to absorb chemicals. Um, any kind of eye protection or face protection, and then long sleeves, long pants. And we'll be demonstrating this here, this cut stump with a chainsaw. So again, you can see having the protective equipment on. And you can see I hit my chain break against some of the, uh, the little branches there, had to stop and put my take my chain break back off. But moving stuff that you've cut out of the way is going to be essential, especially when you have these very shrubby um, autumn olives because they have a bunch of little tiny stalks. Um, and you're gonna need to cut them all. Everything needs to be cut and everything will need to be sprayed. Um, so just double checking to make sure that you got it all. This is using a brush saw. Again, clearing a path so that you can safely get to what you're cutting and then making sure that you're using the right part of the equipment. You're gonna be wanting to use that upper corner there so that reduces your kickback. Um, and again, moving the debris out of your way so that you can see that you've cut everything there. This is just a time lapse of taking down a larger shrub. I don't normally chainsaw that fast, unfortunately. Would be great though. So this is using that, um, uh, that dabber, I called it the magic wand, it's just a dabber. Um, it's a fancy paintbrush, basically. A lot of, some people have used paintbrushes before to do this. A lot of times people call a cut stump treatment uh, painting the stump. So you can see the herbicide is in the, the wands there, and it's just this little sponge at the bottom, and you're just going to be coating this very outside area. This is the part of the tree that's alive. It's gonna be the one that's taking those herbicides down into the roots. So you don't need to waste herbicides on this middle part. Um, and the nice thing about that dabber is it is very clean. You can see nothing was rolling off the, the stump. There wasn't spray going everywhere. Um, it makes a very nice clean 
uh, application. This is the foamer. I also like to use the foamer because I like how it comes out. As you'll see here, it looks like shaving cream and it's kind of fun. Uh, it's also easy to move around. If you miss a section, you can kind of just use the nozzle to direct some of it over. Um, you can see it's a little bit messier, but still pretty well controlled. And again, it's kind of cool, looks like foam. So another way you can do it is through chemical treatments or through spot sprays, sorry. Um, we recommend this for young plants, but it does have a greater risk of drift, um, especially, you know, you're gonna wanna keep an eye on the weather. If it's really windy, you're gonna need to change the nozzle on your backpack sprayer so it sprays a heavier droplet, which won't be taken by the wind quite as much, but will also coat the plant a lot more. You're gonna probably get some more dripping off the plant. Um, you can see that this little guy is probably about hip high on me, um, which is a perfect size. Again, looking at the herbicides, triclopyrs and glyphosates are both really good. Again, the triclopyr isn't going to kill the grass if you do have that spray. Um, but glyphosates will. You can do this anytime during the grow growing season. Obviously, it needs to have leaves on it to do it. Um, but again, keep in mind, berries and the birds will be getting into the shrubs in the fall, and pollinators will be there in the late spring while it's flowering. Um, these herbicides don't have any known effects on animals or pollinators. Um, but again, if you want to be extra safe, maybe avoid spraying during those times. Obviously, don't spray when it's raining either. That's, that would not be helpful at all. Here are some of our spot spray supplies. Um, you can ignore the, ignore the foamer and the wand in there, but um, a spray bottle, you can use that to do foliar sprays. It's going to be, um, you're gonna have to get an industrial one. You can get them at Ace, you can get them at any hardware store. You can't just get like a normal spray bottle from Meyer that's like a dollar. Um, you do need to get something that's considered an industrial spray bottle. Otherwise, the chemicals can react with it and break it down. Not great. Uh, obviously, a backpack sprayer is the most obvious, um, obvious thing to use. When you're doing this, you're going to want to label your containers so you know what you've mixed into them. Um, you can see old spots where we had stickers on them. We label them with the mixture that's in it, the percentage it was mixed at, who mixed it, and what day. So if you go out and spray one day and then life go gets crazy and you don't come back for five months and you look at that sticker, you know that that's been sitting there for five months and maybe you should mix some more, get some new mixture going. And again, that pig mat, the spill kit um, are very important whenever you're going to be mixing chemicals. And again, our PPE, the face shield, the gloves, the long sleeves and long pants, the head protection, closed toed shoes, all very important. This is me spraying a very tiny one here. You have to get that pumped up. It's a little awkward for me. I was wearing Fields backpack and Fields and I are very different heights. So the backpacks are fitted a little differently, but you're looking to get good coverage of that shrub. We have a blue dye in there so you can see where we have sprayed. Um, and you wanna get it well covered. You don't necessarily have to have the whole thing covered and you don't really want it to be dripping everywhere, but a good coverage. Uh, hack and squirts are another kind of chemical treatment. This is not usually recommended for honeysuckles or autumn olives. It does um, require there to be one stalk or one stump that comes up and you get five different stumps coming up from one plant. It makes it very difficult to do a hack and squirt that actually works. So we recommend it for black locusts, tree of heaven, um, things like that. And this again, like the cut stump treatment, is gonna be a lower risk for drift and off-target spray. And again, triclopyrs and glyphosates. So you can see from this picture here, you're hacking into the outside layer of the tree. You're not girdling it. You don't want those cuts to be touching each other. When you girdle it, you are killing it, but the herbicide might not be as effective. Um, and then you're just spraying your herbicide in there. Again, it's gonna be like a cut stump treatment. Your herbicide's going to be mixed at a higher percentage. And again, you can do this anytime except spring. Um, and in the winter, you might need a different formulation. It's maybe not as effective in winter. Um, and again, fall berries, you're killing something, 
that might have berries on it, you're going to have debris left over. Also keep in mind with this hack and squirt, you haven't cut the whole plant off. So it's going to be, there's going to be a delay between when you do the treatment and when, um, when the tree actually dies. So if there are berries on it, there's a chance that they might continue to mature or drop off. So keep that in mind as well. Herbicide labels and safety. Herbicide labels are legal documents. You must always read and follow them. As a general guideline, do ask for help if you don't understand the label. ISN can help you. We're here to help. Shoot us an email, send us a call. We recommend reading any label online because the labels that come on the actual containers are about this big and they write it in tiny little font. It's impossible to read. It's much easier to find it online and read it online. Um, also make sure you're wearing protective equipment. Um, the label will tell you what you need to have and that is the base, the bare minimum that you need to have. But these are all things that we also recommend. Those closed toed shoes, the long pants, the long sleeves, res chemical resistant gloves, nitrile is the best to use. That's what we always use. Uh, a hat or a band, I wear a bandana, anything to give you an extra layer between any off drift or, um, and, your, and your own top of your head. And um, eye protection also seems very important. You don't wanna get that chemical in your eye. Um, again, like I said earlier, do label all of your containers. Any chemical that you mix, make sure you put a label on it so you know what that is. You don't wanna come back in a year and be like, huh, what did I mix in this one? And what did I mix in this one? Um, and do keep the labels for reference. You never know when you might need it to just remind yourself what you're using. Um, also, if you have a spill, it will tell you how to help contain that or who to call. Um, and also like re-entry periods, how long should you wait before you go back in there? Um, shower, we recommend showering after you get done in case there was any uh, drift or at least washing your hands before you do anything like eating, going to the bathroom, taking a smoke break. Um, and again, do follow that label. It is the law. And so please do that. All right, and so now we have gotten into Josh's parts. Josh is the um, forestry assistant programmer for, he does that for Manistee and Mason Lake Conservation Districts. Um, and he is super knowledgeable about very many things and is going to give you guys some knowledge as well. Josh, just let me know when you're ready for me to flip a slide. Sounds good, thanks Audrey. And thanks everybody for attending this, um, this will be a hopefully a useful presentation for all of you. Um, you want me to just give you a nod, Audrey, or say, hey, flip slide, or a thumbs up. <laughs> all right, next slide, please. So a common question is, you know, why conduct this experiment? So the gist of this is that I tried to get something on the ground in response to uh, people not really wanting to mix chemicals. There's a couple reasons on this slide listed for me uh, conducting this experiment, but one of the biggest reasons is because when we start talking about things like mixing uh, Garlon 4 with a penetrating oil or mixing uh, a certain type of glyphosate with this type of surfactant, people kind of hesitate to even implement a treatment and we don't want that to be a hurdle. So I thought, why don't we put an experiment on the ground where the herbicides being used are something you can get right off of the shelf at a store like Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever. And one disclaimer I have on all these slides is that I am not in any way, shape, or form uh, advocating brand names of any herbicides. The brand names you're going to see in these slides are just the ones I happen to grab, and it's because of the percent active ingredients in those. So I'm not advocating any brand of any sort. Um, so again, what I tested was two types of ready to use herbicides that you can buy off the shelf that are more conventional and then a third less conventional type, which is considered a natural herbicide. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So Audrey, can you flip the slide? Thank you. So here's the setup. Um, I had three different sites in two different counties and I did this for three years. And I did it during two seasons, so I applied herbicide in the summer and then also the autumn or fall, if you want to call it that. And I had three types of treatments that went along with the herbicide. So we had a control where all I did was cut the autumn olive and I didn't apply herbicide at all. As you can imagine, the result of that you'll see on the next slide, but one 
was cutting and no herbicide. Another was a basal bark treatment that wasn't really discussed up to this point, but what a basal bark treatment is, is you're taking the herbicide and you're just spraying the base of the shrub for the first one or two feet up from the base. So you're just soaking the base of those shrubs. And the third was one that Audrey already covered, which is called a cut stump treatment. So I and the help I had, we used a brush saw like the one you already saw, and we cut those shrubs at ground level. And then we applied the herbicide to the cut surfaces of uh, those shrubs, just like Audrey demonstrated in those videos. The three types of ingredients that um, I experimented with were glyphosate, triclopyr, uh, both of those have already been mentioned. And then a third was a combination of citric acid and plant oils, and that's the natural herbicide. The range of shrubs was uh, quite wide, so we had everything from shrubs that were one inch in diameter at the base um, to 30 inches in diameter at ground level. And what that really means is that wasn't a single sprout that was 30 inches in diameter, but the diameter of all those clumps that are considered, for all intents and purposes, a single shrub. We had some that were as big as 30 inches. And in terms of height, the heights ranged everywhere from just a foot to uh, 20 and even taller than 20 feet in some cases. So a pretty wide range of shrubs. Next slide, Audrey. Thank you. Here are just some pictures of the experiment. So the upper left corner there, those are the three uh, brand names that I grabbed off the shelf in terms of those active ingredients. So the ortho is the triclopyr, the roundup is the glyphosate, and the Dr. Earth is the uh, citric acid and plant oil herbicide. And then to the right there, you're seeing uh, Kayla Knoll. She used to work at our office. Uh, she helped me out a lot with this. Uh, she and I both used that brush saw to uh, chop up some autumn olive and apply herbicide. And the bottom left picture you're seeing is just uh, an autumn olive that's marked for basal bark treatment. And then the bottom right is an autumn olive that's been cut and is ready to have some herbicide applied to it as a cut stump. So next slide. So here are the results. And, and just to back up a little, um, the active ingredients that you're seeing in these ready-to-use herbicides is much lower than some of the recommendations you see as the norm. So for example, the, uh, the ortho only has 0.7% uh, triclopyr. It's an amine version of triclopyr. That is a much lower concentration of triclopyr than you will typically have when you're mixing uh, triclopyr with uh, a penetrating oil or, or using some of the more conventional approaches to killing autumn olive. So one of the other questions that we're trying to answer with this experiment is can we use much lower concentrations of some of these active ingredients to actually kill fairly big shrubs? And the same is true with the Roundup. The Roundup that was used only has 2% uh, glyphosate and then 2% of some fatty acids. That is a lower concentration of glyphosate than what is typically used for cut stone treatments on autumn olive. And the Dr. Earth is a, a fairly low concentration of the, uh, the plant uh, oil and the citric acid. And what we found is uh, a couple compelling things here. Um, you can kind of read the table to see how the uh, shrubs were distributed across the sites, but and on the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll go over some more of this in, in a little more detail. But in general, the cut stumps work really well for the ortho and the Roundup. So low concentrations of glyphosate and triclopyr can still work really well if you do a cut stump treatment. The basal bark failed completely. And that's not surprising because if you don't have a high concentration of some of these active ingredients, you can't just soak the base of a shrub and hope for it to uh, die. So I'm not surprised that the basal bark treatment failed. And I'm also not surprised that the control, which is cut the shrub and don't do anything in terms of herbicides also failed because autumn olive wants nothing more than for you to come in and just cut it. It will sprout many more stems for every one that you've cut. So next slide, Audrey. So a couple conclusions. One uh, major disclaimer here, this was a really small sample size. So we didn't overall cut and apply herbicide to very many shrubs. It was just a smattering of them at each of the sites, but it was enough to provide some compelling evidence that this is worth expanding. And that's, that's my plan in 2021 is to get some more sites selected and cut a lot more autumn olive and have a lot more sites that we can, so that we can get a more meaningful data set. 
as I already mentioned, uh, cutting shrubs without applying herbicide failed. Um, that you know is as expected, but we wanted to do it just to confirm that. And the basal bark treatments, which again is just spraying the shrub at the base, not cutting it, just soaking it with the herbicide at the base, that also failed. Not a single shrub died when we tried that. And the cut stump treatments were very effective for the ready-to-use trichopyr and glyphosate and mediocre for the ready-to-use citric acid plant oils. I say mediocre because we had 46% of our shrubs die. What that means is that next year we saw more than 50% of them sprout. But the question there for folks who are interested in the natural herbicide is, can one effective approach be that you implement a cut stump treatment with the uh, citric acid and plant oils, and then when they sprout the next year, you soak those sprouts as a foliar application with that same citric acid plant oil. That might work. We don't know. We didn't uh, explore that question, but that may be one we explore in the future. So, and in terms of cost, it's just as cost effective, if not cheaper in some cases, than using some of the more conventional approaches of, for example, buying a uh, expensive jug of a herbicide that has a high concentration of trichopyr and then also buying the oil that you have to mix it with. And then of course you're dealing with the mixing of chemicals. Um, again, a hurdle for a lot of landowners who are trying to do treatments like this. But I can tell you, I calculated the cost and uh, it can be just as cost effective to uh, pull those ready to use brands off the shelf and, and do it that way. All right, Audrey, next slide. So that, that's all on that ready to use experiment. Audrey, you mentioned I would say something about the oil and the herbicide and, and I kind of did just saying that that's another way that people do it, which is not the ready to use approach, but I'll just back up what you said earlier in the presentation, which is if you are going to use like a conventional approach where you're buying brush tox or Garlon 4 or something and mixing it with a penetrating oil, that is definitely the way to go if you're gonna do a winter application, such as a winter cut stump. So I, I don't recommend uh, using any other approach if you're trying to do winter treatments of autumn olive. That oil really helps carry the herbicide through the plant cell walls and down to where you want it to be during those colder months. So the other thing um, I was asked to talk about, because I, I work pretty closely with this organization, is um, financial resources available if you have uh, overwhelming autumn olive populations and you know how quick the price tag can climb in terms of expenses when you're trying to treat it, whether that means you're buying a lot of herbicide or other equipment or you're trying to hire somebody. Well, there is financial assistance through the Farm Bill. And if you contact your local Natural Resources Conservation Service office, you can talk to them about financial help in terms of offsetting the cost of treating autumn olive. And there are two main programs I will um, highlight that you can uh, discuss with your local NRCS contact. And we'll, we'll go over that in a little bit, but I also want to emphasize that uh, patience is pretty important with uh, federal cost share programs. So if you are interested in doing something like this, I always suggest you start the application process as soon as possible because you're looking at about a year and sometimes more than a year of completing paperwork before you can actually go implement your treatments and then get reimbursed at a certain rate from the feds. So contact your local NRCS folks first. You can talk with them and, and understand the application process a little better and see if that's a good fit for you before you proceed. Next slide, Audrey. So one program, you could consider a sub-program through the NRCS. So there's the NRCS and they deliver different types of programs for financial assistance. One is called the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, commonly known as EQIP. Through EQIP, that is the most common first step in terms of getting financial assistance through NRCS if you're trying to control autumn olive. They have a practice that they call brush management. And through the brush management practice in EQIP, you can get a dollar value per acre reimbursement, if that makes sense, to offset the cost of controlling invasive shrubs. Now, if you do something like this, keep in mind that if you have an infestation of autumn olive on your property, but you also have things like uh, honeysuckle or Japanese barberry or privet or multiflora rose, 
and you apply for equip money to control invasive shrubs in a certain area on your property, you also have to control those other shrubs, not just autumn olive. The money is meant to implement good conservation, which means you would be required to deal with all of those invasive shrubs in that uh, area that you agreed to control them, not just uh, one of them. So that's, that's how that works in terms of uh, what you're asked to do when you get farm bill money. And also the payments are not meant to cover 100% of the cost. I think that's a common misconception of some of the farm bill programs. The payments are a set rate per acre in terms of this one, at least to the equip uh, brush management practice. So typically it's a couple hundred to a few hundred dollars per acre that NRCS will reimburse you at no matter how you choose to do the work, that rate you agree to, that several hundred dollars per acre, that is what you're going to get paid as a reimbursement, no matter what. So it's not a percent of your total cost. Your total cost is driven by how you decide to go about doing it, but that two to three plus hundred dollars per acre is what NRCS is gonna pay you as a reimbursement, no matter what. So your, your out-of-pocket is driven by whether you choose to do the treatments yourself or whether you choose to to hire somebody, but the rate you're getting from NRCS is the same, no matter what. Next slide, Audrey. The other program that is uh, gaining a lot of traction, and I think um, more and more people are hearing about it, is called the Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP. The way that we like to think about CSP is uh, it's usually a great follow-up program to EQIP. So typically when people are trying to control something like autumn olive, they start with EQIP, they get some sort of reimbursement through EQIP brush management, and now they're starting to do all these other cool things on their property. So the more cool things you're doing in terms of uh, good conservation, the better candidate you are for a program called CSP or Conservation Stewardship Program. So CSP SP works a little bit different. They do have some, some lower cost share rates for certain practices. But the main benefit of CSP is that you get these annual uh, financial compensation uh, payments for just doing a whole suite of good conservation practices. So if you look at the bottom of the uh, slide there, you can see that typically a resource concern that you're addressing, if you get into CSP, pays about $300 annually, and it's usually a minimum annual payment of about $1,500. Now, all these rates can change each year and with each farm bill, but these are sort of some uh, generalized uh, numbers based on fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20. And that might be it. Next slide, Audrey. Oh, just, just some thank yous. Um, these are all the folks who have helped, including the ISN that's on this presentation. They've been awesome. Uh, I work with another invasive species group further south and of course, NRCS and the conservation districts I represent. So these have all been great folks. And I know Emily put a message up about questions. We'll certainly have some time for that at the end, but I, um, I think that's all I have. So next slide, Audrey. There we go. Yep, that's it. That's everything for Josh. Again, we'll do questions at the end for both Josh and myself. So just to touch on a couple of last additional methods, um, fields or shoot, Josh did mention doing basal bark spraying. It is kind of difficult with autumn olive. That is another chemical method you can use. Um, there's also prescribed grazing. It's been a big thing lately with the goats. Everybody loves goats, they're cute. Um, they're also terrors and they will eat everything. So if you're going to use goats, keep that in mind. They will also eat your natives. They're also supposedly very effective during the winter time because they will girdle those trees. Again, it will kill the tree, it will send up suckers, and the goats will eat those suckers. Um, also prescribed burning. Um, obviously this is going to have a lot more paperwork behind it. You're gonna need a little bit more work to get it done, but you know, if you've got 50 acres of open field, it might be something that you want to look into. Um, again, make sure that you've got all the proper permits and proper training, proper equipment. Um, if that is a, something you'd like to do. Looking at disposal, um, now that you've done your first treatment, what are you gonna do with all of that stuff? Um, you know, when you're doing cut sump treatments, you can drop that, tr that shrub and leave it there. Um, you can take it, pile it up somewhere else. 
you can burn them. Obviously, you're gonna have to let them dry out again. Again, keep in mind those, those berries on them, which you can also eat them. Autumn olive berries are actually um, edible and supposedly very good. I've never had them, but um, kind of, I guess, was described to me as sweet with a little bit of bitter to them. So you can bake with them. A lot of people will make jams with them. Um, another thing that you can do is you can use it. Um, these were actually brought to an autumn olive workshop that we held in person last year when you could still do in-person meetings. Um, a man had cut down all of his autumn olive and had made these awesome dishware out of it. Um, you, can, uh, you can do that and you can ship it. It's not going to come back from that. I can promise you that one. Um, looking at additional considerations, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but the cost, it's money and time. Um, so, you know, like I said, if you want to have a contractor come in and do it, that's going to cost you extra money than if you did it yourself. But if you did it yourself, that's a lot of time you're dedicating to that. Um, so you have to weigh the, weigh the pros and cons of that one. Um, keep in mind that PPE, even if it's just sunblock to get out into the field and spend all day out in a field cutting autumn olive or the digging it up, whatever you want to do, um, all of the PPE you need for whatever method you decide to go with. Um, environmental risks, if you're doing, um, another way you can pull stuff out of the ground is you can get a tractor and a chain or a truck and a chain if you're dedicated that way. Um, but if you do something like that, you're going to be compacting the soil where you're driving out there. Um, like we said, with doing the foliar spray off drift target, when your herbicide might spray a little bit over next to the plant and hit something else, but also the risk of inaction. If you don't do anything, what's going to happen then? It's just gonna keep spreading. Um, so again, keep in mind too, laws and regulations along with, that go along with autumn olive and the herbicide labels, and also the best practices, including PPE um, and safe, doing safety with any kind of tool that you're using. Looking at de decontamination, um, visually inspect all clothing, equipment, vehicles, and footwear. This one right here, that's a big culprit. A lot of people get the dirt packed into their boots. They go somewhere else, that dirt falls out of their boots, and it had a seed in it. And now that seed is taking root into where it is. We have, hold on, I have one right over here. We actually use these hoof picks. They're very good at getting into your boots. Um, and then you can use the brush to get out other dirt as well. So this is gonna get you in the grooves and then brush out those seeds as well. Um, oh, sorry, Fields told me I didn't do any, is that good? You can see the, the pick on it to get into the grooves and then the brush here to get those seeds out. Um, if you're using tractors or trucks, you wanna check the wheels make sure that you are tracking seeds back wherever you're going. Um, and obviously it doesn't really deal with autumn olive as much, but your boats. Boats are a good way to transport one aquatic invasive to another place. Boat wash stations are a, a very good thing to use. Looking at MISSIN. So MISSIN is the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network. Again, it kind of like SISMO, that's why we call it MISSIN. It's a long name. Um, so this is a mobile data collection. Um, they, this is a way that you can record and report invasives on your property. They also have a website that you can use that will, that can show you where infestations have been reported to them previously. We report all of our data out to Messin. Um, there's also information about different invasive species. They can help you with identification. And in general, it is a great resource to use and also to report to so that we get notifications. If somebody reports one of our priority species, we get notifications about that. And I touched on this a little bit earlier, the Go Beyond Beauty program. Um, again, the businesses, the landscapers, the, um, the nurseries have committed to not selling or landscaping with high priority species. Also, this is, we have expanded the program so it now includes landowners. Landowners can get certified for not having invasive species in their own properties. Um, and in, in exciting news, we have a grant that we're going to be really stepping into in the next couple of months to figure out how we want to lay this out, but we're looking at taking the program statewide. Um, and we are thinking about in a year, 
maybe a little bit more. We got a little delayed with um, COVID, so maybe we'll we'll get that out in a year or so. And if you have more questions about Go Beyond Beauty, Emily is definitely the person to ask about that. Um, and so if you're looking at planting, uh, we have some native alternatives to autumn olive. Looking at trees, we've got oaks. Northern red is a great reliable oak. Pines, red pines are a good fast grower. Um, obviously white pines are good too. White spruces are good. You can see, you can see that over here. Um, we do not recommend Scotch or Austrian or black pines. Those are invasive. Um, you can also plant aspens or poplars. Again, we don't recommend Lombardi or white poplar. Those are also invasive. Um, but they are really good at shading out autumn olive. They take time. They're trees. It takes a while for them to grow. But they do also support that native wildlife. Some shrubs to look at. We talked about the buffalo berry already. Uh, the sumac there is at the bottom. It has a beautiful fall color. And then the hazelnut is on the right side there. You can see it's little little nut there. Um, some other ones are low bush blueberry. I recommend blueberries because I like blueberries. They're very delicious. Um, also wild plums are another good one. They're gonna grow faster than trees, um, but they might not be as great about shading out autumn olive because they are a little bit shorter, particularly that buffalo berry. Some grasses and perennials if you're looking at turning it into a prairie. Little blue stem and big blue stem are always reliable natives. Um, fast growers, pretty persistent. Common milkweed is another one, also a pretty fast grower, very persistent and supports monarchs, obviously. Indian grass is another one you can use and bee balm is great for pollinators. Um, again, kind of like the shrubs, this isn't gonna um, shade out any autumn olive, obviously, but it does make it a little bit harder for the autumn olive to come back and you are starting to support that native wildlife again looking at our additional resources. So Habitat Matters um, is our website. And if you look under additional resources, a lot of you already got these additional resources, but we have um, our herbicide applicators list, herbicide retailers, um, doing herbicide treatment specifics, getting down to the nitty gritty about how high do I cut for my cut stump and um, specifically like what kind of formulation, all of that can be found in our additional resources. Um, Michigan.gov slash invasives, obviously, for the state of Michigan, the entire state of Michigan doing invasive work. And the Michigan Invasive Species Coalition is another great invasive uh, resource. And that is the end of my presentation. And at this point, um, I believe Fields and Emily have been looking and gathering any questions that have come up, but we are also open to questions. If you would just type them into the chat, somebody will get them to Josh or I, whoever they're addressed to. Uh, great. Um, first question, uh, should the herbicide be applied immediate, immediately after cutting the stump? Can you do it in a couple of weeks after the cut? Uh, that is a great question, and I should have touched on that much earlier, but uh, you're going to want to apply that as soon as possible. Um, you can usually have about maybe five minutes. You can probably do a little bit longer, but you're kind of pushing it. As soon as you can, you can get the herbicide on that stump, the better. Great. Um, when is the best time to cut and apply herbicide? Uh, it sounds like the spring and winter are the most complicated between the berries and having to use the oil. Yeah, I mean, oil, you know, if you're mixing yourself, um, you're going to be mixing with water and oil might just, it's just a little bit more expensive. Winter is usually a prime time for us to treat because winter is not when we're treating 50,000 other invasive species. But, you know, summer works great too. It's really just a personal preference on when you have that time and the resources to do that work. Um, great. Um, so another question, um, if you were to use the ready to use herbicides in a spray bottle, how would um, that be used in the winter when oil would be needed? I'll leave that we, one for Josh. We didn't actually look at that. And that's, I'm glad somebody asked, because I meant to mention that we didn't look at the winter uh, use. The reason being is that the formulation of the triclopyr, for example, on the ready to use is an amine version, which you typically don't use in the winter. Um, you would typically use an ester version of triclopyr in the winter with a penetrating oil. So without doing like a small experiment to see if there would be any good effect, I would suggest you don't try the ready to use uh, herbicides that 
were in this experiment during the winter. I only have data on summer and fall, so I would say stick to those periods for ready to use. Okay, great. So someone uh, mentioned that they uh, just removed like 12 acres of autumn olive off their property with a forest mulcher. Um, and they cut it at ground level uh, and they want to know what your recommendations would be uh, to control growth in the future. So they, they use that forest mulcher and then uh, just looking to what to, to do next and into the future. I, can I chime in on this one, Audrey? Go for it. We, we've got sites down in Mason County where I just looked at this very thing and I would say spot treat the sprouts. And, and I'll just share this with everybody. There are a couple sites I looked at. Some of the contractors that have gone fairly deep in the ground with other mulcher, there it's not 100%, obviously, but there's been a better success rate than I thought there would be with the lack of re-sprouting. So if you get far enough down into what's called the root collar of an autumn olive, you can actually do a lot of damage, and it may not sprout as readily. But you have to go basically below the soil line but you're gonna get sprouts on a lot of those stumps that, that are probably left there from the mulching. And I would just say, treat those with a foliar application of herbicide because they're gonna pop up and you're gonna get a seed bank that pops up as well, most likely. That's exactly what I was gonna say as well. That, that kind of leads back to the beginning when I said um, a combination of methods is usually a good idea. And it's, you know, you're not gonna wanna go back through a area that you treated the first year with a cut stump treatment um, the stuff that comes back isn't going to be cut stump worthy, but you could come back and foliar spray it. So that combination is what you're looking for. Okay, great. Uh, someone asked if they could use uh, ready to use herbicide in the foamer. I, I don't think so. That foamer that we use comes from Green Shoots. Um, it's a specific company. They're the only company I know of that makes it. Um, I think the ready to use herbicides usually come in their own spray bottle, right, Josh? They do, and it's actually not recommended to take a ready to use out of its already existing application bottle. So the reason it's ready to use is that you apply it in the bottle that you've been provided because you, the inert ingredients, some of the inert ingredients in those are trade secrets. So you have no idea how those might react if you try to put it in some other type of bottle. Oh, great. Um, so someone asked, how long after removing autumn olive does it take for your soil to accept natives? It sounds um, like maybe the soil is damaged. Uh, do the chemicals from the cut stump leach into the groundwater? Not with, not if you're properly applying them usually. Um, and it depends on the native that you're trying to plant. Something like milkweed, I think would take, a, you could plant that within a year. Josh can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but there are some natives that are real good at growing, especially prairie natives are used to having to be aggressive. Um, so you could hypothetically, you know, come in later that year if you do a spring treatment and plant in the fall. Um, again, Josh, correct me if you've got a better idea. No, that's great. And to, to go a little further with that, some of my research sites down in Indiana, the seed bank of the natives popped up the very next year after we obliterated a bunch of honeysuckle and autumn olive that looked like the soil was sterile because nothing was growing there. And we did cut stumps with the herbicide. And that very next year, we had everything from trillium to may apple to spring beauty and they flourished. So the same would apply for a, a restoration in terms of planting. Um, so I, I think that the site is, is usually just find that very next growing season after you've done the treatment. You still have to watch those uh, seed bank though, the new ones that are coming up out of the seed bank in terms of the invasives and, and balance that treatment with planting natives. Cause you may have to do a foliar application to some of that seed bank uh, stuff that comes up. And now you've got a situation where you're dealing with new seedlings and you put natives in there. So just be strategic about that. Great, so that's, that's all our questions from the people typing them in. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, maybe Emily will, oh wait, we got another one. Um, we bought a brush chain grabber to pull bushes out of the, uh, with a tractor, someone says. Uh, should, we, should we then spray anything on the soil left behind after ripping the trees out? You could if you have like stumps um, that are left or if you have tiny little saplings that are still there. 
a lot of times if you have like a, a re-sprout is just going to be like one small, very thin stalk. A lot of times you can just pull those out, especially if you've already disturbed the soil around it. Again, obviously if you have like 10 acres, that's going to be a lot of time. A foliar, going back through and foliar spraying it would be probably more time efficient. Uh, great. Another question. Um, after cutting down the shrubs, is it best to pile them up and burn or chip? If you leave them, will they seed and spread? Uh, kind of depends what time of year. Um, you know, you, if it's already got the berries out, um, you can chip them as well. But uh, burning or chipping in general, either one works, whatever you've got the resources to do. Um, the bear, unfortunately, once the berries are out, they're pretty hard to get rid of unless you're going around picking all the berries off the shrubs before before you cut it or move it. Josh, if you've got a different opinion, let us know. No, that sounds great. And I can tell you, we I've been on some projects where we chipped a lot of slash from autumn olive and honeysuckle and people were worried about the germination and the mulch. And we didn't really get a lot of it, we think, because the mulch pile got hot enough. So there doesn't even tend to be a lot of seed germination when you get that pile thick and heavy enough. And I think, Audrey, you mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's good to pile it in one pile if you have berries so that you're restricting your berry fall to one little area of your property. So don't spread your slash out with berries all over because you're just going to be planting berries all over the place. Uh, also keep in mind, um you want to keep that stuff on property. Again, going back to that law that I talked about earlier, moving it off of your property is considered moving the species and that is technically illegal. So you are going to want to try and keep it on your property. And like Josh and I both said, in one spot is best. Great. Uh, someone also asked, um, after you do a, a, cut, a cut stump treatment and it kills the, the shrub, um, do you just wait, wait it out until the stump rots away? Or what do you do after that? Stumps can be pretty persistent. Um, you can dig it. You can do like a pull out. Um, I've usually, we've always just left the stumps there, planted things around it. Um, I don't know if Josh has done an, any stump removal. I, I let them rot. I just let them be. Great. So, um, there's no more uh, type questions coming in, but we are gonna just briefly um, let the, the people on phones, um, we're gonna unmute them and see if they have any uh, questions to ask you guys. So if, you, if you're on a phone call, um, go ahead and start talking if you have any questions, and if not, um, we'll be about uh, time to wrap it up. All right, well, that, I think uh, no more questions are coming in. So if you guys wanna um, wrap it up, Audrey, that sounds good to me. Yeah, perfect. Um, again, if you think of a question later, again, if you're like me and you start to do the work and then you're like, wait, what about this? Um, our con my contact information is on there. Josh's contact information is on there. You can contact either one of us with questions. Um, you can also contact anybody else at ISN, Fields, Emily, or Katie, who is not here tonight. Um, everybody's here is happy to help you with any questions that you might have. Uh, and again, we just want to thank you guys all for coming tonight. And uh, thanks, Josh, for coming in and putting your uh, research in. It helps, definitely helps us get information out there. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks again, everybody. Have a great night.